Aloha, welcome to the sanctuary. Today's message, the gateway to blessings. I hope you enjoyed, you enjoyed your Thanksgiving. We did. Now, the bigger celebration is just a few days ahead. But I think we should all consider the fact and celebrate that we found the road to heaven. And uh, there's an epic celebration awaiting for every one of us. I often speak about faith and how God honors our faith when it's unwavering, sacrificial, unashamed, and unrestricted. I think it would be good for us to be reminded about the path God created us to find and follow, described as the narrow road. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. Think about it. Jesus emphatically said in John 14 and 14, 6, He said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What it means is that uh, God wants us to take up our cross and to follow him if heaven is, is really our final destination that we want. All other roads lead in a different direction away from God, but in the end it circles back to where God waits at an intersection. And this is where your road will finally end or it will continue. But because of God's deep love for us, I believe, he will give us a final opportunity before we get into that intersection to change the direction of our life. Second Peter 3, 9 says, God, who is love, is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish but to repent, to change their direction. No matter our sin, He wants to forgive us only if we're absolutely serious about it and want to change. However, we get to choose which road we travel on. If we make the right choice, we have a roadmap called the Bible. Uh, a GPS, okay, God's positioning system called the Holy Spirit that will help us navigate the narrow road, a straighter road with less hazards along the way. And we don't have to get up in the rabbit trails that always lead to dead ends. So God knows exactly where you are. You're never lost. He's just a prayer away. Here's a question only we can answer truthfully. If we do and, and if we are willing to admit our mistakes and need some changes in our life, we'll get a firmer, a firmer foothold on the narrow road. I once heard a compelling question that I had to think about more seriously. If I was accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me of being one? Would my life, daily life re re reflect the presence of God? Or would I live a contradicting life? Am I a Sunday-only Christian or someday-only Christian? We have to be cognizant of the fact that people are watching and judging us from a distance, whether we, we like it or know it or not. Are we, are, is our life drawing people to Christ or contradicting and pushing people away from Christ? I know we all have flaws and we're far from perfect, but we still must be making every effort to change, to get better, to be more like Christ. Not every goal that we have is a good goal or one that God will approve of. We all have made bad choices. I know I have made many in my life and had to pay a dear price. It might have looked good at first. However, it ended up in disaster. Proverbs 14, 12, and 13 says, There is a way of life that looks harmless enough. Enough, look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end up in heartbreak. Might be having fun now, but it'll end up somewhere else. So how do you know that the kind of goal that you're making, God will bless? First of all, you have to consider, did I pray about it? Will my goal honor God and always include Him from the beginning to the end? Will the kind of goal that uh, I have, will, will it give Him honor? Any goal that causes you to trust Him, to depend on Him, to love Him, and to love others, to serve others, and to be unselfish is a great goal God will always approve of. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, when you eat or drink or do anything else, always do it in honor, to honor God. Amen. Everything can be done, even in your daily routine. Driving to work, working, or doing your laundry, or giving somebody a blessing anonymously. Okay, by doing this with the right motives, 
You do it with humility and gratitude. Matthew 15, 16 says, Let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Not you. You don't get any credit for it. God gets all the credit. Everything we do should reflect our love for God and love for others. God is not going to bless a goal motivated by greed or envy, guilt, selfishness. He does honor goals that is motivated with this desire, deep desire to, to love Him, to love others and serving them to meet their needs. Why is it so important to have goals based on love? Because if you have loveless goals, you start to use people for your advantage, not theirs. It's less about accomplishments. Remember that. It's less about accomplishments and it's more about relationships. It's about learning how to love one another. 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, Do everything, everything in love. The first goal of your life is to learn how to love on a deeper level. Love your family, love your spouse, your neighbors, even those who don't love you or really hard to love. There, uh, there are many who are about to make or have made decisions that they inherently know this, that God wouldn't approve of, but they still make it. Uh-oh. It may be something personal or professional or relational. Okay, Whatever it is, if you don't feel a sense of peace, it would be, it would be a good idea to stop before you go any further. Take a time out, consider your ways, and ask yourself a couple questions. Will it honor God? Is it motivated my, my love for Him and for others? If there are, go for it. God says go for it. If not, reconsider your ways and maybe you should make a, another better, better decision. Proverbs 16, 9 says, We plan the way we want to live, but only God makes us, makes us able to live it. God. God must be the major factor in every part of your life and every part of your, every part of your goals. He is the, ter the determining factor whether you will be successful or not. God will, God will provide everything that you need if he approves of your ventures or your goals. When Jesus walked on earth as a human, he deliberately gave over controls of his life to the Holy Spirit. He wanted to demonstrate that it's not by power, not by might, it's by the God's Spirit that he can do things that are impossible. The principle here is with God, all things are possible. With the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. We need God's Spirit to guide and to empower us. The Holy Spirit can and will help us make the changes we need to make from inside out. It's based on, not based on our willpower, it's based on God's power. Amen? We need God's Word to guide us. The Bible is our owner's manual for life. The more we read it, the more we study it, meditate and memorize it, and then apply it, the more successful and fulfilling our life will be. When God gave Joshua the, the great lifelong dream of taking over the promised land, Okay? He commanded him in Joshua 1.8. And this is what is, is important for all of us. This book of the law shall not dis depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way, way prosperous and then you will have success. If you do it God's way according to his mandates, you will be successful. Living consistently according to God's will will bring con uh, continued success in every season of your life. We need to stay in constant connection with God. And the way we do it is through prayer. Prayer is the major reason God wants us to pray is He wants to speak to us and be with us on a daily basis. It has to be a habitual thing for all Christians, like breathing. Prayer is an act of trust and obedience. God says to ask, then you will receive. You can pray for anything, information, wisdom, understanding, protection, provision, finances, whatever it is. But most of all, just to be with Jesus. God loves to hear from us on a regular basis, not only when we're in trouble. For any reason, any time, in any place. You don't have to be in a particular place. Anywhere, you can talk to God. If God has all the answers, why wouldn't you want to spend time with Him? 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for. Key, according to His will. Consider this truth. This is really important. It takes a team to fulfill a dream. 
Okay? We need the support of others, a, a very tight, trusted, a group of, of, of trusted friends. They know when you're sick. They know when you're having a tough time, when you need a break, and you know their time too. They know when, uh, when you share the goals with them, you share your failures with them. You do life together with them. We're going to need them when we make the right kind of goals and pursue them seriously. And we need them to cheer us on. We can't do it alone. God didn't design us to do that. Ecclesiastes 4.12 puts it this way. By yourself, okay, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-strand rope isn't easily snapped. We've got to do life together. We need one another. Amen? Our journey on the narrow road will, will have many obstacles along the way. But sometimes God will place them intentionally there. John 16 says, 16 says, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. God knows everything. God experienced everything. And he knows how to get around them and how to defeat them. God doesn't cause trials and sorrows in our life, but he redeems them for our best advantage and to benefit others. It's called personal ex experience. It's not about the God that somebody else, is, somebody else knows. It's the God that I know. My God will fulfill all of my needs according to his riches and glory. My God. Everyone will, might, not might, encounter many struggles in their life. Are you struggling with something today? Could it be that God is up to something good in your struggle? You're about to be challenged so you can be changed. God is getting ready to bless you to make changes in your life. The Bible teaches that our biggest struggle in life is with God. Why? Because we want to be in control. No matter what your problem is, meet financial, physical, or whatever it is, your biggest problem, okay? The biggest problem is that you don't want to obey God. You don't want to trust Him. And that makes it a bigger problem. It means to surrender to God. He knows the way. Have you ever been in a no-win situation? Perhaps you're in one right now. Why do you think, what is, what's behind that? Many times, God is. God often allows crises in our life in order to get our attention. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay stuck where you are. He wants to change you. He wants to help you grow to be better, to be different, to be all that he created you to be. And so he sometimes allows crisis on our road. Why? Because we rarely change until the pain we feel is greater than the fear of change. We don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. Hmm. God can use your situation to move you to where you need to be. A crisis gets your attention and forces you to look toward God. When God allows crises in your life, He usually doesn't solve them immediately. It's a process called transformation. He allows them to go on for a while because He wants you to see, He wants to see if you're really serious about getting to the other side, about seeking Him. If God answers our prayer immediately, Sometimes we can think that God is a genie. So don't delay. Just obey God. If you're in a crisis right now, hang in there. Don't give up. Don't run away. Don't escape. Hang in there. Most, problem, <clears throat> most problems you have in your life didn't get there overnight. You may have worked years getting yourself into that mess. I know I have. You may have uh, some deep-rooted wrong habits that need to be ripped out. So God isn't going to remove those. All at once. Remember that God is, is with you and is always for you. When you ask God for help and trust Him to provide, you will experience a peace of His wisdom, the blessings in spite of your circumstances. In fact, the faster you obey God, the shorter your crisis will be. This can be a very sensitive topic I'll be talking about. And um, if you want God's peace and joy, here it is. I've seen too many relationships and families negatively get affected but one ugly thing is called the cycle of hurt. The cycle of hurt has to stop, and you can stop it if you're serious about it. We talk about removing the drama in your life and replacing it with God's peace and joy. Who wouldn't want it? So often we, 
when we deal with difficult people, it's easy to form judgments about them based on their behavior and their attitudes. Hmm. But have you ever stopped to wonder what has led a person to be that way? Nothing just happens. There's a link between causes and effects. We need to discover the causes before we can deal with the effects. Jeremiah 32, 18 says, You show unfailing love to thousands, but you also bring the consequences of one generation's sin upon the next. This scripture is speaking about generational cycle of hurts and sins. Unless someone in the family makes a deliberate, serious choice to stop it, sinful and dysfunctional behavior will be passed down from parent to child and along many generations.